Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast today. My special guest was is Mr. Connor Smith from Northern Ireland, who recently won the the SAS Who Dares Wins Reality uh, TV Show Challenge. Connor, how's it going, man? I'm very good, Richard. How are you? Thanks for taking the time to speak to me this evening. Absolutely, I'm doing great. You know, every so often you get you hear back from an old friend or someone that's really special to you, and it kind of makes your day. Well, I just had one of those moments, so you get you get Richard at a hundred percent today. So. <laughs> <laughs> i'm doing looking good forward to it. looking forward to it absolutely uh i have been uh, as well and, and you know we, we've kind of talked for i guess a few weeks now uh, about getting you on and you know you had some obligations with the show there but i'm glad it's all worked out now and uh, i've been looking forward to it so you you've your name's been circulating quite a bit because of this show so how did you get involved with this challenge to begin with um so this uh the sas who dares wins for the for the viewers that maybe haven't seen it or don't live in the UK and haven't had a, a chance to kind of catch much of it. Um, but it's basically a re reality show which puts civilians through a condensed version of Special Forces selection. So Special Forces is literally the best of the best. I think it's the equivalent to the, the Navy SEALs maybe right. in America. Um, so that's usually like a six month course, but for TV purposes, they condense it down into like two weeks. And um, so it's been quite a big TV show here in, in the UK and Ireland for a number of years. And, you know, it's something that I've always just looked at and thought I could do that, you know, <laughs> like maybe, maybe that's being naive, but I've always just thought there's no doubt I could do that. And um, so we were on tour last year um, pre COVID uh, with Lord of the Dance. So I, we were actually in, uh, in China when COVID hit like the world headlines and um, that's another story for another day, but we pretty much had to flee China to, uh, to try and get out of China before the, the borders closed down. Um, we went right away around the world, Taiwan, then Mexico, then back to Europe um, when COVID eventually caught up with us and we got sent home. But I was on tour in Germany and, and was going through the application form for the, for the most recent series um, and, and didn't finish it. And then we got sent home through COVID and, you know, I was just kind of at a spare end, not doing much, not knowing what to do. You know, professional dancers all over the world were just kind of flown into this unknown state of, oh, we can't perform. We can't do what we love, you know. Right. What do we do now? Just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. What are we going to do now? So, you know, I applied, I applied for the show thinking that I wouldn't hear back and, you know, I got through numerous stages, had to, everything was done on, online, obviously due to COVID. Um, so I did interviews with producers and casting people. And then I had to do all the fitness tests like recorded so that they could um, see that I could run a certain distance in a certain time and lift certain amount of weights, like certain distances. Um, and yeah, it just went from there and um, with about two months to go until the course was being filmed. I got the shout to say that I was either going to be a recruit or a reserve. So it was looking likely um, that, that I would be given the opportunity. And, you know, it's just been a whirlwind, such a journey, um, you know, something that I didn't really expect to happen. Like certainly when I got there, you know, all of the recruits, um, we we're all grilled on our motivation and why we want to be there before you go, because they, they want interesting characters and you know people who've maybe overcome adversity and overcome challenges uh, because it makes it more interesting for tv right so um when i got there i sort of certainly felt the imposter syndrome i was like why am i here do you know like people had overcame cancer there there was a firefighter who was at the grenfell uh tar tragedy which hit london in 2017 and um, you know people had been abused and and I was just thinking, whoa, like I was just teased for doing Irish dancing. Like, why am I here? But I was just so privileged and honored to be given the opportunity and um, and the platform to, to showcase Irish dancers, which is what I wanted to do. So, um, you know, I'm just so pleased that it, it came off well. I was able to showcase dancers in a positive light and hopefully be an inspiration for not, not only Irish dancers, but, you know, other male dancers out there or kids that maybe do disciplines that aren't perceived as manly and um, right. to, you know, follow your dream and pursue your passion with, with all of your heart. So, uh, 
yeah, that's what I'm all about. Well, that's good. I mean, first off, congratulations for winning that. That's a feat in and of itself. And, you know, I've, I've only, of course, I'm in Houston, Texas. And so what we see of, of your programming over there are little snippets that come out on Facebook. So we didn't really couldn't enjoy the, the entire series. But I'm looking at all those things that, that you and the others were doing. And from what I understand, there were 21 of you in total and you were in Scotland. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And I was looking at all that. I said, you know, there's no, there's no way I'd rappel down the side of a mountain or a hill. <laughs> and, you know, I'm scared to death the heights, you know. So, talk about uh, Connor, if you will. Some of the obviously all those things that you did were challenges and probably pushed your comfort zone. What were some of the things that really kind of made you maybe stand back and think, can I really do this, or I'm going to really have to pull down deep to get through this next challenge? What were some of those things? Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of tough to pinpoint specific challenges. Um, but for one, definitely, um, there were some like fighting tasks and controlled aggression tasks. Um, so basically, one of them was called this red man task. So one, oh. of, the, one of the recruits who was um, actually a mole. So he was actually an ex special forces soldier. And um, so he was like, in with us undercover for a couple of days. Un unbeknown to us to try and get you know more information about us and we're what what we were really like when the eyes supposedly weren't on us and um, so basically what it was all about controlled aggression and you know using your aggression in a good way to overcome with, with whatever's in front of you um so like naturally i'm not really a fighter you know i'm more of a right. lover than a fighter i mean i've gone to, <laughs> i've gone to a boxing club for, yeah. for a while but more for a fitness type, uh, more from a fitness and, you know, to get ready for going back on tour. And I've never done any sparring or anything like that. So, um, you know, all I've done is punch the punch bag, which doesn't punch back. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was a big challenge going into that task and being like, well, can I really be aggressive and, and, you know, use my aggression in a positive way. And then we also done a, a fighting task where it was pretty much boxing against uh, one of our other recruits. Um, so that was that was one going into it that I was quite maybe just wary going into it. Like, can I really do this? And, you know, how will I be able to react under under that pressure? Um, right. But thankfully, I, I, I came out pretty well on, the, on those tasks and was able to con control my aggression and not go over the top mm -hmm. because that's they want you to go from that sort of code red aggression and then be able to switch off immediately. Um, that's hard. It is, it is hard, definitely, because you get roped into it and, you know, you, you're you pumped on that adrenaline. So being able to just switch it off, um, it takes a lot of mental strength. Right. Um, but other other um, challenges which were really tough was the resistance to interrogation phase. Mm. So this is a phase which lasts over 12 hours and basically um, they subject you to techniques which aren't actually... Um, permitted by the British Army um, <laughs> okay. to see if, if, if you would be able to resist interrogation. So, um, you know, you're, you're hooded, you're, there's, there's goggles put on you, um, you're subjected to crying babies and noises such as pig squealing, screeching glass, drill noises, and, and you're held in stress positions, which I certainly underestimated um, going into that, that phase of the course. Um, so then in between all these stress positions, so, you know, you have to like sit on the floor with your legs completely straight and your body's upright um, and you're forced into, you know, keeping your hands behind your head. If your elbows come forward, the slides, oh. you know, you're pushed back. There's a lot of extreme pressure on your core. Um, another one is then literally just your arms straight out in front of you. If they drop slightly. And, you know, that the, they'll put you back in place and um, facing walls like your, your arms up against concrete walls. And, you know, you, you just go numb after a few minutes and then the pain in your shoulders. And um, it's really, really quite tough, but it's it's more of a mental challenge because you're getting those noises in your head. Um, and then once the interrogators start to question you on what you're doing and it's a real mental game because you don't want to let your team down. Right. Um, you know, so that plays on your mind and then you, you sort of think, Oh, I'm letting my team down. Like, what am I doing? You know, maybe I should give up. And 
it was just a really, really tough mental challenge. And I felt like going into the course, obviously because my background in, in Irish dancing and touring professionally with Lord of the Dance, um, do you know, I was quietly confident with the physical challenges, uh, but those mental challenges, that's just a wee bit of the unknown. Do you know, like right. I always felt as if I was mentally strong, but um, that sense of unknown before going into that, will I really be able to uh, cope under that pressure for, you know, over 12 hours? Um, so that was, that, that was, that was probably the biggest challenge I, I would say. Mm. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. And, and, you know, tying that back into, into Irish dancing, and I want to get into some of your dance history here in just a little bit, but, you know, those of us who have been involved with Irish dancing for a, a while would understand that concept of teamwork, that, uh, that concept of, uh, you know, working together for a common goal. I mean, you learn that in your early dance classes, if you're on a Kaylee team, uh, you know, or if you're doing just a local pub performance and everyone's going out there representing the school and, trying to look uniform and then you take it up a, a, a hundred steps or a hundred degrees up there to Lord of the dance. And everybody knows Michael Flatley's productions. And I mean, he, it's got to be as perfect as humanly possible. And, you know, no margin for error. Everybody sees that. And so we sort of learned that early on. How did those principles in Irish dancing, whether it was back home as a competitor or as a student or on the, on the tour up there in front of, tens of thousands of people how did that help you get through some of these challenges very very much so it's funny because when i first applied um i wrote in the application form that i don't think there's anything more polar opposite than special forces selection than irish dancing but it turns <laughs> out there's so many parallels right and you know like these are just values and qualities that are instilled in you from you're a kid like you know yourself we start Irish dancing from you know three years three years and, and, and above and uh, you don't realize how much you learn and, and these qualities that will stick by you for the rest of your life so obviously discipline number one is drilled into us like since we can barely even talk do you know and it's shoulders right. back arms down by your side standing proud with your chin raised and that stick that just sticks by you throughout your life and you know I, I do a bit of teaching now at home and I, I try to say to the kids, I'm like, these qualities will stick with you for your whole life. Like you don't understand the confidence that it'll give you as well. You know, being able to enter a room and, you know, be proud with your, with your shoulders back and your chest out. And, and that really makes a difference on people. And like, if you're making first impressions with people, that will really uh, last. Um, so I knew straight away that, the discipline would hold me in good stead and uh, the directing staff, the ex special force soldier they were really struck with how disciplined I was. Right. And um, so I, I was really happy with that because beforehand we had to do like a master interview. And um, so throughout the show, if we're doing a physical task, it might cut to that interview and, and show a couple of seconds of you talking about your background and stuff like that. So Going in, I was quite bullish about, you know, the strengths and the qualities that Irish dance has given me. Mm -hmm. So, like, I could have looked quite foolish if, if you know, it didn't work out in my favor. So I was just really glad that that came across. Um, but another thing that really stuck with me anyway is resilience. Um, and, you know, kids just growing up, you, you build up resilience when you first try to walk. You know, you're crawling as a toddler and you try to try to get up on your feet and you try to walk, you fall. What do you do? You get up and you go again. And, uh, you know, once you, you go to Irish dancing, you're always, well, in my view, anyway, the emphasis is always on what you're doing wrong. Right. So I, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I sometimes just had so much doubt in my head that I was failing because, you know, you're getting told that you need to turn your feet out more and you need to cross your feet and you need to point your toes but that builds with it resilience because you keep going, you keep right. going to strive to be perfect. And, you know, Irish dance teachers are renowned for being strict, but that is so good for, for you, you know, as you grow. And like, it's certainly something that has stuck by me. And I'm not saying that it was similar having an Irish dance teacher shouting at me and having an ex <laughs> yeah. shouting at me, but you know, it's, 
it's it's not that different or it's not that different so you know when someone's screaming in your face like we've been used to that our whole lives right. so you know it doesn't really phase you as much as maybe someone else um, and then certainly you know throughout throughout dancing in my teens and then going on to lord of the dance i mean the the professionalism and, and the high standards that are expected of you in, in lord of the dance is uh, really something that betters everyone you know every day like i'm in my 30s now and when we're on the road i still feel like i'm improving as a dancer as a performer you know you never stop learning and it's that strive to be perfect and to keep getting better which uh, you know is just such a good quality to have and obviously there's a lot of pressure put on us in lord of the dance because michael flatley the guy who right. started the whole industry yeah. expects the best of the best but ultimately that makes you better um and there's no hiding places out there do you know like we're <laughs> nope. performing to a couple of thousand people and there's dance directors and there's dance captains you know at the side of the stage watching your every move so you know there, there's no time to be complacent and you always have to perform and i feel as if that was something which really um stood me in good stead for the course because you know ultimately on that uh, selection course there, re- there was no hiding places and you had to be on it mm-hmm. every single minute and, and switched on and ready to go and then another thing is the robustness you know we haven't even talked about fitness yet but right. you know the fitness aspect and the strength of dancers and you have to go you know five six times a week and certainly when we're touring professionally and you know it's six nights a week and that, that's the least that you'll do Mm. On weekends, we'll do double shows. So, you know, we're doing double the workload. Um, and and the, sh- the quality of the show has to stay the same. Do you know? It doesn't matter if there's 2,000 people in the audience, if there's 10,000 people in the audience, that audience deserve to see the best show of, right. the, of their lives. Um, and, you, you know, so you have to build up that robustness in your body, in your muscles, in your joints. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how sore your feet are, and how sore your legs are you need to be ready to go once that show starts and so you know like I I just think Irish dancers sacrifice so much throughout their lives and sometimes that's overlooked and so that's what I wanted to do was try and showcase that and you know not only are dancers strong physically but but mentally because of what they've overcome throughout their lives Right. Well, you know, you you mentioned several good points there, and one of them early on in your response was about, uh, you know, coming up through Irish dancing. We, when you're a student, you hear a lot of fix this, fix that, that could be better. Ah, that doesn't look so good. You get a lot of. Some people would look at it as negative feedback. When you get older, it's like, well, it's not really that negative. It's really just designed to help you. So if you could speak to, not actually, if you could, you are speaking to people that, you know, that are watching this podcast, what would you say to the, uh, the younger dancer out there, be they male or female who are in the middle of their classes, uh, they're, they're training as an Irish dancer, they're trying as hard as they can, but they're getting a lot of that fix, 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 and not necessarily boy, that's amazing. Do it again. You're so amazing. That's what they want, but what they're going to get is more of the, the correction. I know personally when I'm teaching my dancers every so often, you know, during the break or after class, it's, they'll say, they'll just come out and say, do I ever do anything good? <laughs> you know? And it's like, and, and you're, you're kind of taken aback. It's like, well, of course you are. You know, what about the four good jobs that I told you earlier, 10 minutes ago? See, we don't tend to remember that. We tend to remember some of the negative things. What would you say to those people that are going through that right now? Uh- for me you just have to stick with it i mean every teacher is wanting the best for you so you know you just got to think that they're trying to push you to to your potential so you have to sometimes focus on the negatives to then turn that into a positive and you know sometimes it always it can feel daunting because you know you feel like i'm always trying to turn my feet out and you keep telling me that i still need to turn them out but it's about small goals, you know, and repetition, repetition, repetition. If you keep practicing and keep working on, on those weaknesses, whatever they may, may be, you can then turn those into a strength. And, you know, that can ultimately push you to be better. And um, so it's just about 
ultimately the the teacher's heart is in the right place you know and that's to get the best out of you um and it's definitely going to push you to be better you know i think uh as you say you always remember the negatives rather than rather than those wee positives mm -hmm. um but you know you just got to listen to your teachers have faith in your teachers um because ultimately they're going to push you to be the best exactly so let's we've been touching on a little bit of irish dancing as it relates to your preparedness in the show but let's go back just for a minute to the origins when did you get started in irish dancing and who were your teachers and talk about a little bit of that early experience for you yeah no worries so originally i'm from the festival dance tradition mm -hmm. in northern ireland so um this is a a breakaway um federation which um, really only started about 50 years ago. Um, and so it's very much different in style to CLRG and some of the other organizations out there. And uh, so we would dance to slower music. Right. And it would be, the emphasis would be a lot more on storytelling and interpretation, especially in, in set dances, um, rather than, you know, military precision, precision technique and, you know, bashing out as many trebles and uh, <laughs> yeah. double clips that you can. Um, but to me, when I was younger, it was just Irish dancing. You know, I just went to the local Irish dance school. And in my area, it just seems to be there's more festival schools than there would be CLRG or okay. um, the commission type style. Um, so, yeah, I was dragged by, by, by my mum when I was four or five years old. Uh, my older sister, Lauren, she, she um, went to the Irish dancing before me. Um, and she's also a professional dancer. She's been touring with Riverdance for over 10 years now. So uh, she's been a big inspiration in my life. Um, my mum was a dancer. So naturally, um, we all just got dragged along. And, uh, you know, it didn't take too long before... I realized that I was doing quite well, was going to competitions and picking up medals and trophies. And not only that, there was a lot of kids that were in my uh, school that also went to the Irish dance class. So, and a few boys as well, which I absolutely loved. Right. Um, so just continued competing, obviously growing up as boys do, you get teased, you know, you're a girl, you're a sissy why aren't you playing football or soccer or rugby? You know, you're, you're doing dancing. And, you know, it was quite tough because I was almost embarrassed of, of what I was talented at, which is a big reason as to like why I've done this, you know, is to try and kind of show anybody who's, who's going through the same sort of struggles that, you know, we all have. Um, do you know that you should be proud of, of your talent and, you know, listen to yourself and, you know, don't be, deterred by what anybody else has to say about, mm -hmm. about your sport or, or your discipline and um, so my sister Lauren gradually as we went through my, my sister Lauren was just an unbelievable dancer and you know people talk about natural talent Lauren had a natural talent but she also backed it up with huge work ethic and determination and um, so she grew up festival throughout her whole life never went to CLRG or whatever, but got into some of the professional shows. Um, Rhythm of the Dance at the time, which is one of the smaller productions. And uh, I was about 14, 15 at the time. And I was thinking of giving up the dancing because um, certainly in the festival tradition, there wasn't many boys that I was competing with. So mm. I was competing against girls all the time. Naturally, the girls were always winning. <laughs> and so I was further <laughs> down the pecking order. And uh, yeah, it sort of just wasn't sure what I was doing. And then Lauren started to get into the professional shows. And then I thought, whoa, like if Lauren can do it, maybe I can do it. You know, I, I wasn't sure of it, but I thought maybe I can do it. And um, so that then became a goal. So when I was 17, because Lauren was just so spectacular, um, I felt I needed to move to CLRG as being a boy as well, because, you know, the boys, the difference between the boys and festival and CLRG, just the technical ability is, right. is so different. You know, it's so athletic. It's so, when I went to CLRG, it was almost like learning how to dance again, because oh. I was used to dancing slow, right. and like lots of rhythm, rhythm 
And then I was going to do, you know, a heavy jig at a million miles an hour. And it was, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was really tough. It was a tough transition. Um, so when I was 17, I moved to Kevin Armstrong in Belfast. Mm-hmm. Um, so whilst I was then studying at uni, I just kept going to classes and really working hard to try and, you know, bridge that gap between the level I was at and, and, and the guys in the commission in the commission world. So my, my goal was just to get into a professional show. You know, I didn't actually do that much competing. Okay. I was busy studying, studying at university as well. So it was kind of tough to balance that along with, you know, going to feshes every weekend. Um, but, you know, my sole focus was to just try and get better because I wanted to try and, and, and tour the world and, you know, see a bit of the world whilst also performing in front of audiences because that performing really intrigued me more so than the competing side of things okay um so yeah I, I just kept kept working away whilst i was at university and then rhythm of the dance were doing like a second trip for like a short tour of mexico so when i was 19 i had applied for that and was given an audition and was fortunate enough to be accepted for this temporary tour in mexico back in 2009 which was just amazing. So that was that was kind of my first um, taste of the professional world. So then I came back and finished my studies, and then joined up with Rhythm of the Dance after after my studies. And you know, my idea was just I'll do a year or two, see a bit of the world, you know, experience that tour life, and then come back and get a and get a real job. And you know, within that, then. Um, Lord of the Dance were looking for people because they were doing a big Feet of Flames production back in 2012. So I happened to apply for that, got a bit of good fortune and, and you know, got my foot in the door. And then later, later the next year, I joined up with Lord of the Dance and I've mm. been fortunate enough to be there ever since. So, okay. um, you know, I kind of if you if you'd have asked me when I was a kid, do you think you'll ever be in Lord of the Dance? Do you know, the the answer would be no. Do you know, right. Lord of the Dance was a dream, but definitely not something that I ever thought was achievable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there's a lesson there in itself, do you know, especially talking to that 17-year-old kid who was a festival dancer and, you know, had to move to this commission side to really up my game and, you know, try and get caught up with these guys who were so technically good, mm-hmm. so athletic, so fit. Um, you know, it was like it was a completely different style of dance. So, right. Um, I mean, it just goes to show you, it's never too late. You know, I was seventeen, and looking back now, I wish I'd made the transition when I was maybe eleven or twelve, and then I would have been more, more involved in the competing side of things, and you know, really pushed myself that bit more. I feel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's true. Well, not to mention the fact that you were at one of the one of the, the best Irish dance schools out there historically. I mean, the Armstrong School is very well known in the at least in the, the commission circles, you know, as one of the sort of legendary schools. They produce a lot of great dancers and still do, from what I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you spoke, you speak of Lauren and I've actually had her on the podcast a number of months ago. And, uh, you know, she's an amazing young woman and, and dancer. And, you know, and to her credit, I mean, she's kind of helped bring the festival style of Irish dancing to the masses. You know, a lot of people never even heard of it. And then, yeah. you know, and then they see her or teaching people, teaching some of the troop members in river dance, the slip jig and some of the other steps. And it, it kind of gave it a whole new image in a way, because here's this, you know, very prominent show dancer uh, showing us the style of Irish dancing that I say, as I say, most of us have never heard of before. So props to her for doing that. And then of course, here, here you are, you're getting this spotlight of, of, you know, your accomplishments in this reality show, also your accomplishments in, in touring with Lord of the Dance, which is in and of itself a very special achievement. So you've been with the show for, for 10 years. And we always tend to talk about how glamorous it must be. And Matt, wow, you know, who wouldn't want to be just doing what they love to do all the time, but there's got to be sort of a challenging, maybe not so glamorous uh aspect of it as well what have you found connor to be some of the challenges and uh stuff like that that you've gone through as part of a member of the show yeah definitely i mean we're really privileged to to do what we do and you know like i said touring the world and you know traveling to all these different countries and being able to perform on front of thousands of people and then not only that performing with such talented people as well do you know when i first joined lord of the dance 
I still look up to, you know, some of the, the, some of the lead dancers and some of the dancers that have been there for years and years and have all this experience. And, you know, I'm like, whoa, like I'm brushing shoulders with you. Do you know, it's right. surreal, really, really surreal. And guys that I've looked up to, um, you know, for years. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, life on the road can get tough. And as you say, it can't, it, it, it isn't always as glamorous as it, as it sometimes seems. Um, do you know, but I, I always kind of have a positive outlook and, you know, try to think that like, you know, things could be worse. Like right. when I was growing up, I used to do a lot of work with my, my granddad. I still do the odd time. And, uh, you know, that's literally like digging ditches and, you know, hard manual labor. So when times get rough, I always say to people, you know, it could be worse. You could be digging ditches. <laughs> But certainly, you know, sometimes, you know, we could maybe do a, an eight hour bus journey in the morning and, you, you know, you arrive straight to the venue and then we're on stage, rehearsals, lining up the show uh, before doing it, you know, and you, and you haven't even really rested. But although you've been on a bus, you might have got a couple of hours sleep. You know, it's not the most comfortable place to get some sleep. And, you know, the, the likes of that tiredness and going every day can sometimes just catch up with you. Um, but, you know, it, it's just about getting your mind in the right place, getting your body in the right place before showtime. And, and you know, usually once the music comes on and once those lights lights go down, you know, it's it becomes natural that your body just springs into action. Right. And, um, you know, sometimes even, for instance, when we maybe go to China, sometimes the food isn't brilliant. You know, it can be a struggle to find food that, like, everyone likes. And, right. You know, so certainly times when you've been traveling and, you know, haven't had much sleep and you're struggling to find food to get into your body, that can be when, it, when it's extremely tough. But, you know, as I say, we're really privileged to do what we can, what we do. And, you know, we try not to complain about it because at the end of the day, who gets to get a stand innovation when they finish work every night? Do you That's know, true. it's something that we should, we're just so privileged to do and something that, um, you know, that, that drug you know, feeding off the energy of, of the audience is just a special, special thing. And I think that's something that a lot of professional dancers struggle to recreate once they, you know, hang up their shoes and walk away from, from performing. Right. Well, you know, you mentioned digging ditches and stuff like that and reading Michael Flatley's autobiography and some people may or may not be familiar with this. His early stories was he was digging ditches before he got the the call to do the Eurovision and then later on Riverdance. So there's something to be said about taking those undesirable, dirty, rough, tough jobs to teach you work ethic and to teach you stick to to get through the rough, dirty times in life, which we all go through. Definitely 100%. I'm a big advocate of, of you know, work ethic. I feel like it's the the most important tool that you can have because without it, you, know, you will not do anything. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've often maybe performed in, I remember when I first went to Mexico in 2009 with that uh, rhythm of the dance tour, mm -hmm. I performed on a, on a Saturday night in just outside Mexico city um, at a, an outdoor arena. And then I think it was the Tuesday or Wednesday morning, I was working with my granddad <laughs> <laughs> in, in hailstones and rain back, back here in County Down. And, uh, you know, it, it's another one. It makes you not get too far, too uh, ahead of yourself, you know, right. and it keeps you grounded, which is, which is a, I think, something that we all need. You know, you, you can't get too ahead of yourself. Um, especially in our industry, because, you know, the entertainment industry can be up and down. Sometimes, you you know, you could be busy for six months and then have a couple of months off where, you know, it can be quite hard to find work here or there. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm always glad to come back and, you know, help my granddad out and I do a bit of work here and there. And I certainly think that work ethic is something that, uh, you know, has driven me to where I am and, and without it. You know, right. more of the dance wouldn't have happened. And, you know, this SAS, Who Dares Wins, certainly wouldn't have happened without it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to have had those values instilled in me. And my granddad is, is a big factor in that because, you know, ultimately he showed me about hard work and determination, mm -hmm. you know, and getting the job done uh, when I was only a kid. Right, right. That's true. 
And, you know, it's nothing like going through really hard, challenging times to teach you some, it sometimes teaches you life's most valuable lessons. And oftentimes, as you can probably attest, when you're in the middle of going through those challenges or maybe doing something that's not very glamorous, uh, you think, why am I doing this? What What's going to come? Nothing's going to come out of X, Y, or Z. But then later on, something does come out of it and, may, and you reflect back onto that challenging time, the difficulty you had and you, what it taught you. And it really does. It's almost like you had to go through that in order to be prepared for what comes up in the future for you. So you have to be open to what's what those lessons are going to teach you. That's very interesting. Um, speaking of styles, I was having styles of dancing, I should say. I was having a conversation with a teacher the other day, and we we got into the discussion of the, the male and female style of Irish dancing. And that in the past, there was definitely a very clear male style, if you will, and female style. And then we were discussing that over over the t- over time, it seems like some of those styles have sort of uh, melded together. And it, guys will now do material that may have been previously sort of reserved for girls. And sometimes girls will have a little more aggressive style that would be characteristic for guys. I advocate that I think it's important for the guys to sort of have a style that complements their natural abilities. Same with females. What is your thought on that? Yeah, definitely. I would, I'd have to agree with you. And, you know, I feel like all dancers are, are built differently, you know, and, certain dancers are really powerful naturally and then maybe other dancers you know are more graceful and more elegant so I definitely feel like you know that's part of the teacher's job too is to try and find choreography which complements each individual dancer right um, but certainly when, when I was young everyone said to me like oh you dance like a man and you know that's just something that kind of I I done naturally and you know my, Lauren and I always laugh because when we used to watch the VHS of Riverdance and Lord of the Dance, you know, we loved both of them. <laughs> but like, I always seen myself in Lord of the Dance and Lauren always seen herself in Riverdance. Mm-hmm. But just because of those particular styles, you know, I, I felt as if, you know, I, I was real kind of masculine and, you know, the drama in Lord of the Dance and the fighting between the good and bad. Right. Um, I always felt as if that would complement my style. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Lauren is just so graceful and so elegant. And certainly the likes of the the solos in, in, in Riverdance really complement her style. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm a big advocate, you know, of of doing whatever suits you and what feels natural to you. Right. Um, and, and, you know, Irish dancing is still evolving. I mean... I'm seeing some of the, the young guys and girls come into Lord of the Dance now and some of the material that they're dancing, I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> I know, you're right about you know? that. And, it, and, and that's something that then I'm seeing these dancers coming through and then that's almost driving me on too because I'm like, I need to keep up with these young guns. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's evolving year to year and, you know, that's just going to keep happening and keep happening and keep happening. And I think it's, I love to see that because, you know, somebody once said that if you if you stay at the same level, you're actually going backwards because everything's moving forward and everything's right. getting better. Yeah. So, you know, I, I feel as if to, to watch it evolve and, you know, different styles come in and different styles come out. Like, I, I just think that's really, really interesting. And, you know, I, I think that comes with the territory in every sport and, and in every discipline, you know, mm-hmm. it's always changing, always evolving. And, you know, you really need to be keeping up with the pack. So I think it's really interesting. That's true. And as you say, it's, it's it certainly has evolved over the years and it, and it shows no signs of slowing down. Um, interestingly enough, I had a, ever so often I'll get a student that'll ask me, Mr. Richard, how many dances do you know? Uh, and I'll tell them I mean, I, hundreds, probably hundreds of different versions of, of hard shoe and soft shoe. And they'll say, well, can you ever learn everything there is to know? And I said, well, no, and you will never truly master Irish dancing. You will, you can become a sort of a master if you will, in that you have a high level of proficiency, but that you will never be able to learn all there is because it continues to change. And I think it's good that it changes because things that don't change, as you say, you sort of go backwards and they start to die. Exactly. It's like, if you don't work your muscles out, they atrophy, they get smaller and all of a sudden you can't do the things you used to do. 
So going into that, in that vein of fitness and evolving styles, as you said earlier, Irish dancing now requires a high level of physicality that it didn't have. We didn't work out. I, I retired in 2004 and, you know, we weren't working out. We, we might dance two or three days a week coming up to an Oireachtas or something like that. But shortly thereafter, all of a sudden you hear people cross training and, and, you know, doing anything they can to strengthen themselves to do these new movements. How have you seen the physicality change and what does it take now to be someone that's going to be successful, not just in competition, but someone who may want to spend, you know, years on, on tour with a show like Lord of the Dance? I mean, it just takes massive, massive sacrifice. And, you know, more recently, it's just, as, as, as we were saying, it's just evolving and it's getting, you know, tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, certainly, like, to compete now on the world on the world stage is just, you know, those those guys and girls are just different level of athlete, you know, and it, you know, it takes more than, to be just going to your dance class a couple of times a week. And, you know, that that's the end of it. You know, you really have to be doing everything you can to improve your strength and conditioning, to improve your flexibility, because otherwise, you know, you're going to be left behind. And certainly on a professional level, you know, the pressure that we're under in Lord of the Dance is just intensifying year on year. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, that brings out the best in you. And, you know, when I first joined, that was when it was just starting to turn. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, guys who had been there for years, they were saying like, oh, we're doing all this working out and we're doing lots more stretching beforehand and lots more um, ice after the show and cool downs and, and physios and, you know, but ultimately it's bringing Irish dancing, you know, a century forward um, mm-hmm. because, to be able to perform at, at the highest standard night after night and to be able to keep going, you know, you, you need to look after your body and you need to look after, you know, that's everything from your diet to your training, to your stretching, to your conditioning. And, uh, you know, I, I personally love it because I'm into fitness and I'm into working out just in general, but to then do it like on a professional scale and, you know, we go into work and it's right guys, we're getting our dinner and then we're going to work out and then we're going to do a stretch and then we're going to, you know, do another hit workout before then doing the show. Gosh. Like, I, I, just <laughs> love the, I just love the challenge of that, you know, and then maybe after yeah. the show we'll do some cool downs or a bit of yoga uh, before getting in, in an ice bath. And um, so I just, I just love that kind of the, not just the, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, the structure of it too. I, I love the structure of, you know, going into work and boom, 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 this is what we're going to do. And ultimately that pushes you to be better. And, you know, as, as I said earlier, like I'm in my thirties now and I feel as if I'm getting stronger and fitter. On her. And, you know, that's only going to benefit you better because, right. you know, it wasn't that long ago I was at the gym and I was trying to, you know, build all these muscles, but I was almost trying to get too big. Mm -hmm. which then affected my dancing in a bad way because, you know, I was heavier, you know, I wasn't as nimble. I wasn't as athletic, but I had bigger muscles on the top half of my body, which, you know, was the wrong thing to be doing. I thought I was doing the right thing, especially like when it came to joining Lord of the Dance, I thought, Oh, like, you know, big muscles will be a good thing. But, you know, ultimately that was, yeah. Once it starts to affect your dancing and, you know, it's a, it's a fine line. But uh, not only the fitness of Irish dancers, but just the fitness industry in itself is also evolving. And, you know, it's only more recently that, you know, science is improving and they're getting more data about, you know, what you're putting in your body and how that affects you. And, you know, so it's it's constantly evolving and and you need to keep up in order to to be able to compete. Mm -hmm, Exactly. Connor, some people will hear hear what we're talking about, the physicality and what it takes now to be the, uh, to be up the best where, where everybody wants to be. And they'll say, you know, it seems like the gap between sort of the average dancer and the top dancer is increasing because maybe one, they can't afford 
personal trainers or gym memberships or better food, which, you know, seems unfortunately that the healthier the food is, the more expensive it costs. Junk food's a dime a dozen, you know, and they'll say, well, it seems like, you know, it, it, it almost becomes an unattainable goal to get to the top if you can't, if you don't have these extra resources. Do you, one, what are your thoughts on, on that mentality? And two, if there is that disparity, how can people maybe within their own resource abilities, whatever they can attain, how can they, even if they can't afford maybe to, to get where some of the top level folks are or don't have those resources, they still can improve themselves in some ways. How would you address those two topics? Def, definitely an interesting one, but you know, the, the first topic, I feel like that's, it's kind of almost in every sport, which is sometimes, uh, you know, a real shame. The likes of Irish dance dresses and stuff, you know, typically the more expensive ones are going to be the nicer ones, which will get you noticed more. And, you know, I, which is a shame because at the end of the day, it should come down to the dancing and the dancing only, you know. But unfortunately, that is that is the industry that we're in. And, you know, that's that's just one of those ones that, it, it can be tough but at the end of the day you just need to give it your best and, and, and give it your best shot maybe if you can't you know afford a personal trainer maybe there's some online programs that you could use um, my sister and i have just recently started uh, fit id and um, which is an online personal training platform specifically for irish dancers and you know that's really affordable and something that we've worked hard to give um dancers bridging that gap between personal training um, and then an online program. So it's like, it feels more personal, but it is affordable and, and something that um, rather than just doing a lot of burpees and a lot of squats, um, what we focus on is building up the strength and endurance in your legs, working on our core, which is definitely going to help your dancing. Um, and then having that balance between hip workouts and dance fit classes and to really push you to be your best. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, trying to find um, affordable things like that, rather than going to a personal trainer and, and spending $50 an hour, you know, there, there's monthly online programs out there that, that, that you can find. Um, but yeah, I, I think just in general, it's just about pushing yourself to be the best that you can be. You know, sometimes I feel like, Obviously, there's if you're competing against a hundred dancers, you have to sometimes, you know, think, oh, I want to beat that person, or I want to beat that person. But you know, sometimes people forget that sometimes you're just competing against yourself, do you right. know? And right. you know, and ultimately if you're bettering bettering yourself, then that's that's an amazing outcome, you know, whether you get a podium or you not you don't get a podium, if you're improving as a dancer and a performer. And if you're enjoying your craft and you enjoy your sport and you're pushing yourself to your limits, then, you know, you got to take the positives out of that. Right. Exactly. And I think so many dancers and maybe even to be fair, some teachers think that all the rewards in what we put into this thing that we crazy sport, folk dance, whatever you want to call it, that we love Irish dancing is summed up in where you're standing on the podium. If you got first place, okay, there's your reward. That's it. Second place, whatever. I don't believe that. I think, yes, you want to, if that's the result of your hard work and you're, you're pushing through your challenges, that's icing on the cake. But the real reward is what you learn on the journey to get there. Definitely icing on the cake. That is the, that's the perfect way to put it. I was, I was actually trying to think of a phrase like that, <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and Ultimately, it comes down to what you want. Everyone has different goals. Everyone has different reasons for doing what we're what we're doing. I'm sure you know yourself as a teacher. You get some kids who come in, and they love the social aspect and the making friends, and they love that more than the competing aspect. And you know, then you get other people who are super competitive. I'm a super competitive person, but when I moved to CLRG, my main aim was to try and get into a professional show because I was passionate about performing and traveling. So that was two passions, which I wanted to try and combine and, you know, try and take on those opportunities. So even though I'm super competitive, 
going into the competitive Irish dance world, I wasn't really that fussed on doing it. Right. And, you know, that, that's probably for a couple of reasons, probably because I was afraid of failing as well, which is something that I've been working on, you know, since then. Like, I feel as if if I went back now, I probably would delve into the competing side more mm-hmm. but because I was, I almost felt like an outsider. I'd came from this festival tradition, which was so different. And, you know, when I first went to the competition and seen the standard of the other guys, you know, there was no doubt. There, there was like a doubt in my head going like, whoa, like I'm going to come last, mm-hmm. you know? And, right. but at the end of the day, my goal was to improve my Irish dancing uh, to get to a standard where I could, you know, get into a, a small, a small production, one of the professional shows, you know, it didn't have to be Lord of the Dance or River Dance. Some of the smaller ones give great opportunities to dancers out there and, you know, what? that's one thing I would say to anybody who aspires to be a professional dancer. If you don't make it to the top first go, you know, try and get into whatever shows you can. Get experience in bars and, and pubs that have dancers because that'll, that's where you learn your trade. You know, not everyone can get into river dance and Lord of the Dance first time. And sometimes they are just looking for that bit of experience. And let's not forget, it's not always about the best technical dancer because you have to have more than that as, as a performer. You have to have presence. Right. You know, you have to engage with the audience and, and, you know, feed energy to them. And that's one thing I love about, about a performer. I love, it's almost like a tennis match because they're giving us energy and we're giving them energy back. Right. And, you know, it's a two-way street throughout that performance. And that's something that I love. And, Obviously, at the minute, we aren't doing any touring, and that's just something that I'm dying get back, to get back to. <laughs> I'm that, sure. Yeah. That feeling is, is, is just incredible. But, yeah, you know, everyone has different goals. Um, everyone is different throughout life, let alone just in the Irish dancing world, you know. So, mm-hmm. as you say, if titles come and medals come, icing on the cake. But ultimately, if you're improving, you know, week on week and year by year, um, and then that can only be a good thing. And, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes I feel like people get caught up in, in like short term goals and, you know, like I really want to be better at turning my feet out in a couple of weeks, you know, mm-hmm. it takes time. These things take time, but right. you know, if you stick with it, if you're consistent and if you're, you know, putting in the repetition and repetition and repetition and working and working and working, it'll eventually come, you know, you don't, you don't notice that difference in a matter of weeks, but if you showed a video of someone dancing and then a year later, you know, the difference is night and night and day. So you just got to take time with it and, you know, you'll get there eventually. That's true. You know, and you, we talk about the awards that that can come with Irish dancing, whether it's that, you know, plastic trophy that you've got up there or that crystal or the invitation to go to river dance or Lord of the dance, those are all culminations of our effort. But I know for me personally, if you look back at your old trophies or medals that you won, you know, they get, when you win them, it's, it's the most amazing thing. It's the reward for your hard work and your dedication and your sacrifice. But then 20 years on 10 years on some, some future point in time, you look back at them and it's like, Oh, they got dust. Oh, they're not as shiny as they used to be. They don't mean as much to you as they used to, even though you're still proud of that moment. I know for me personally, when I look at those, those mementos of my journey personally and dance journey, I, I, I recall the now with have, you know, having all the experience of hindsight, uh, there's, there was isolation. There was lots of time spent by yourself. There were lots of questions that went through your head. Uh, am I doing the right thing? Is my teacher happy with me? Uh, Am I wasting my time? What am I going to do with all this? You know? a lot of those questions and those little battles that go through probably every Irish dancer's mind, especially as you get a little bit older. Can you, if you will, Connor, talk about maybe some of those internal challenges or struggles that you may have dealt with and how you overcame them. So, I, th- I mean, I think ev- anyone who, you know, gets to the top, not, not even gets to the top, but anybody who puts a lot into their sport or their discipline it's all about sacrifice, you know, and um, certainly to get to my goal, which was, you know, to try and get on the, on the touring circuit 
um, with some of the shows, you know, that meant going out of my comfort zone, especially when I, when I moved from festival to CLRG, that was definitely out of my comfort zone. And back then, you know, even going into class, I was really shy and, and timid because, you know, all these other dancers in the class were doing all these amazing things that I couldn't do. And, um, you know, so that was, that was a struggle. And, and, you know, I was, I almost felt as if I was within myself, I was a different person in the Irish dance class because, you know, I, I didn't want to look silly in front of the other dancers and, and stuff like that. And then I'd come out of the dance class and it would just be like, right, that's another class under my belt. And, you know, like small steps, like I'm, I'm getting better, but it was just, a, it was definitely just a struggle. Like, I just didn't feel overly comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, even though that that was tough, I still kept going back, you know, my two, three classes a week, where, whatever I was doing. And, you know, I was having to like drive from university for 45 minutes to get to my dance class. Then I was doing that for three hours and then a 40 minute drive home. You know, it was long days. Sometimes I was working with my granddad and had to shoot off early to go to Irish dancing. And, you know, it would have been easy sometimes to just go home. But at the end of the day, you know, you just need to you just need to keep cracking. And, you know, if that's if that's your goal, if that's your aim, ultimately, in my eyes, if you want it bad enough, you will do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even once I got into Lord of the Dance, I got there and, and almost felt I'm not up to the standard of these other guys, you know, so um for me to be there now for like, you know, eight years, I feel like that's one of my biggest achievements because I've got there and I've, and I've stuck there and, you know, I've cemented my place, but that's taken hard work that, you know, other people maybe don't see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, uh, when people are maybe in the changing room getting ready or whatever, you know, I would be practicing my steps. I'd be in the mirror trying to improve my stage presence. You know, I'd be watching other dancers to try and take, tips that they were doing and you know see how i could get better and mm -hmm. um, and you know like that's not easy and certainly when you first join and you maybe you don't feel as if you're up to standard there's a lot of pressure on you you know but it's it's fight or flight what do you want to do do you want to do you want to knuckle down and show that you deserve to be there or, or do you right. want to shy away from it and maybe try to hide in the background right um, and you know ultimately it's it can be a cutthroat industry and if, if you're not um you know if you're not performing night after night you know you won't be there for very long so um you know i feel as if just that work ethic and you know that determination and you know striving to be better uh, and then not only that being a good team worker and you know trying to be positive and enthusiastic and um, all these things that i've tried to showcase and um, since I've been in Lord of the Dance and, and, and touring professionally and mm -hmm. um, have ultimately stuck by me. Right. Uh, you know, you talked about getting a little bit older as a dancer and dancing normally, any kind of physical activity, but particularly as coordinated and disciplined as Irish dancing is, it tends to favor youth. <laughs> it's easier to do this when you're, you know, 15 to maybe 21 than it is to do it when you're 46 like me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what is your advice, Connor, for people who want to maintain whatever standard they can for longevity, but as they get older? Because obviously the considerations for your health are different when you get older than when you're younger. Definitely 100%. For me, I think it's just about looking after yourself and, and looking after your body. And, um, you know, certainly when I first joined Lord of the Dance <clears throat> and, and some of the other professional shows, you know, as soon as we were maybe finished the show, it would be like, right, let's get, let's get out as quick as we can. Maybe we can grab a beer at the hotel. Right. You know, that's fine when, when you're 20, 21. But as you start to get a bit older, you know, you really have to look after yourself and, and look after your body. And certainly as times have changed on the professional scene as well, and there's there's been more pressure put on us and, you know, you have to be performing. I think that's changed with the territory as well. So not only do you start looking after yourself, well, I certainly did as I started to get older. Um, but, you know, we're pretty much told you have to look after yourself after. So let's do a stretch together or let's get into the ice beast. 
um, all of those sorts of things. But, you know, I think it's just taking care of yourself, making sure that your mobility is good. You know, certainly my hips aren't as, as mobile as they used to, but now I'm doing a lot more work on that to ensure that, you know, they are as mobile as they possibly can be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, trying to find out from other people, okay, you're a mobility specialist. How can you help me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or go to a physio and, you know, ask questions and be inquisitive to, to other people who, who've been there and, and done it or are experts in, in that field. Um, you know, so, so for me, it's about, you know, doing whatever it takes to, to ensure you're in, in, the, in the best possible shape. So, you know, if I'm going back on tour, uh, you need to be super fit. So it'll be, you know, a personal trainer or it'll be going to the boxing classes to get my high intensity up, going to the studio for a couple of hours. And, and then at the same time, doing lots of stretches, hip mobility work, you know, making sure that uh, I'm, I'm in the best shape possible for, for the tour. Right. You know, there's there's something about strength in numbers. And when you're as you as we've sort of touched on a few times through the interview, you know, for guys, it's it's different going into something like dancing and especially even in Irish dancing. I know here in America, a lot of people still don't know what it is. They've never heard of it. They may have seen a couple of clips on YouTube or something like that. So they're going into something foreign. Uh, and then couple the fact that maybe they're a guy and like you say, the stereotypes may be affecting their decision. What would your advice be to them where, you know, if, if they're considering doing it, but they're just not sure, am I going to get picked on? Am I going to look silly in front of all these girls? Because we know most dance classes are predominantly, you know, female. Uh, what's your advice to them? Cause I know when I started, and I started a little bit older in life. The first thing I did was look around for the guys. Where are the guys at? You know, I think at teacher's mail, I saw his picture on the internet. You know, where's he at? Because we we were sort of put in the side room with a, an older lady that was like an assistant instructor. And we're going, it was me and another guy. It was like, there's a guy teacher here somewhere, right? You know, there's something about looking for people like us, you know, people that we can relate to and, and sort of share that insecurity, if you will, with. What's your advice to people, uh, young men or, or of any age that may be looking to start, but have those doubts? Yeah, like every everyone has doubts. And, you know, if you have a passion or if you have an eye for something and, and you want to do it, my advice is to just do it with, with all of your heart. And, you know, try not to think about what other people think. And, and I know that's very easy to say, but to try and put that into your mind and just think, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm just going to go for it because that's something that I want to do. Um, and like, that's what my story is all about because I've been given so many opportunities to travel and, you know, tour with Lord of the Dance. And, you know, there was, there was times where I was going to give it all up. You know, I, I was getting picked on in school. I was getting teased for being a girl. And, but what a shame that would have been to give that up because of what other people thought. Right. And, you know, I was really fortunate. My mum was really instrumental in kind of letting me see that, you know, I could potentially do this as a career. And my, my old sister, Laura, big inspiration and I had a real supportive family around me. So I was fortunate in that aspect for maybe, but for maybe people that don't have that, you know, support network, just follow your dream and, you know, give it your all because you don't get second chances. And, and I can kind of resonate with that too, because when I was about 15, I took on uh, fiddle and violin classes because I hadn't learned an instrument. <clears throat> and my younger sister, Lindsay, and my, the, my other younger sisters, they all started going to uh, musical instrument classes. I don't know why my mom and dad didn't send my, me and Lauren and, and my <laughs> other brother. But it was like from the fourth child down, they all started going. And, and I was a bit jealous. I was like, whoa, like I'd love to, to learn an instrument. So similar to what you were saying, I was in a classroom with like 10, 11 year olds and I was 14, 15. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I felt so silly. I was like so much older than these kids. And, you know, pretend or not pretending, but learning, trying to learn the, the, the fiddle and violin. And ultimately, after about four or five weeks, I gave it up because, you know, 
I felt silly in the classroom with these other kids. And, you know, it's something I always regret because I'm like, if I had it just stuck with it, you know, before I knew it, I, I knew it, maybe after three or four months, I would have been put into a different class with people who were a little older and I would have felt more comfortable. Right. And you know, that's, a, that's a big regret of mine. And, you know, something that I, it's always plays in my mind. I'm like, why mm-hmm. did I give that up? If I'd only stuck, stuck at it. Right. Um, because now I'm 31. So if I go to learn now, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be even tougher. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like the world has made great strides more recently and being more accepting of people and, you know, being you and, you know, not listening to other people. But at the same time, the world has become a lot more connected with social media and, you know, you're putting yourself out there for the likes of hate online. And, mm-hmm. you know, that can be tough for, for kids and, and people who maybe don't feel comfortable within themselves. Um, but, you know, my main message is just to, to be you and listen to you because ultimately you don't answer to anybody else, but, but what's inside you. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, don't have any regrets in that sense, whether you want to be an Irish dancer or a gymnast or a ice skater or a soccer player or a rugby player, whatever it is, do it for you and, and give it your all. Do you know, don't have right. any, don't listen to anybody who, who wants to tell you that you're doing this wrong or you're doing that, do you know, listen to you and, 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 you know, do a discipline that, that you have passion for, because ultimately if it's a passion, then it's not going to feel like work to you, do you know? And, and I think you really, you really need to do something that, that you enjoy and, Mm-hmm. and that's how you'll get the most out of it mm-hmm. but also be willing to take feedback <laughs> you know, a, lot, <laughs> a, a lot of the the young folks that i teach you know that they, they grew up in a of course are growing up in our modern society and, and there is a lot of emphasis on you 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 and not necessarily we 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 which is how i grew up you know it's kind of like the group you got to take responsibility for the group and then that that attitude has changed a little bit and uh, i tell them yes it's important to be unique and follow your path but people are put in your life to help steer you and help shape you and don't be don't be so caught up in yourself that you're not willing to listen to people who care for you and that could maybe save you some heartache down the road <laughs> exactly 100 percent. you know but the likes that like i i always tell any, any dancers you know listen to your teacher like it's so 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 important and um i'm not sure ab- about you guys but Anytime we have like small class fashions here and um, we'll, we'll bring in, you know, an adjudicator from who's a teacher from a different school or whatever. And it's funny how the kids who dance for you listen to the criticism or, or the tips mm-hmm. from another teacher, mm-hmm. but it's the same criticism and the same yep. tips that, you know, I've been giving you for the last six months, but yep. because it comes from somebody who's outside suddenly it strikes a chord. So, you know, all, like the teachers, all we want is, is, is the best for, best for you. Right. And, you know, as you say, we're, we're trying to lead you on, on the right path. So, you exactly. know, take it all in and, and embrace it. You know, if yeah. I always tried to, to prove teachers wrong, do you know? So if, if I was told that I wasn't turning my feet out enough, then that would be my goal to just try and turn them out as much as possible. Yeah, that's um, true. Yeah. So yeah, embrace that challenge and, you know, try to try to let it drive you. Doubts as well, doubts in your mind, you know. When I took on the SAS challenge, I literally felt like the Irish dancing world was on my shoulders. Mm-hmm. And I put so much pressure on myself, but at the same time, that pressure drove me on and that drove me to be successful. Right. And, you know, in the lead up to it, in my preparation, that just meant that, like, I was going to leave no stone unturned mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to give it my best shot, you know. So that pressure can be can be a real tough thing. But if you use it in the right way um, and, you know, I, I feel like there's so much about comfort zones. If if I'd have been given that opportunity five, six years ago, I don't think I would have went for it because, you know, I've just grown as a person these last couple of years. And, you know, even back when I was, you know, competing and, you know, went from the um, festival side to the commission, you know, like that was all part of the journey. And then I just feel like sometimes people are reluctant to push, push themselves out of your comfort zone and, you know, 
people are afraid to fail and you know That's i just feel like the journey that i was on i put myself under so much pressure that i almost couldn't feel because i was so driven and you know my purpose was so strong and that really drove me on and you know i'm just so so privileged to be given that opportunity and to be able to showcase Irish dancers in a positive light. That's true. And, and, you know, you touched on some good issues there uh, and good points with, you know, as far as doubts and letting those doubts, it's normal to doubt, but to not to let it overpower you to the point where you, you get paralyzed and you, you just will not, you know, proceed forward. Um, I know I'm sure you've, there's been things in your life that's made you doubt yourself. I know in my life, it, everyone's going to have that story, but you know, so many opportunities are wasted because you can let that paralyze you. You know, exactly. let that doubt scare you to death and you don't even want to step forward. You just want to run this way, this way, or even worse is to run backwards <laughs> to retreat. Um, you know, what are some of the stories? I wanted to ask you this before uh, we conclude the interview. And, and that's some of the stories that's come out of the SAS challenge, your most recent, uh, obstacle to be going through there and then maybe some stories from lord of the dance that you that stick with you that were maybe not just funny or quirky or whatever but things that have served to benefit you and help you improve um okay it's a tough one and uh, let's you know I'll, I'll touch on the so there's a part on on the sas course where the directing staff they didn't believe that i was an irish dancer you know, they, they felt as if this guy definitely has some sort of military military background. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't believe that you're an Irish dancer. So this was actually a mortifying experience. And um, certainly as a dancer, my worst nightmare sometimes is when somebody just asks me to dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Especially especially in a strange environment like you know, I mean, it's fine if you're down the pub or if you're at a wedding and somebody puts on music and okay, everybody gets up and does a dance. Right. But, you know, sometimes just being put on the spot, do a dance, you know, it's my worst nightmare. And, you know, Lord of the Dance, it's, you know, it's properly choreographed and we know what we're doing and we work on our choreography so mm -hmm. much that when the music comes on, you know, you, you just do it automatically. Yeah. And, you know, even now, like, something I'm trying to work on is my like improvisation as a dancer, because that's something that wouldn't come natural to me. So like, that's a comfort zone for me. So I'm trying to push outside that, you know, and, and be better at, at improvising. So obviously I was on this SAS course and they drag you into a mirror room to kind of give you an interrogation style interview um, where they find out a wee bit more about your background and your motivation for taking on the course. And, you know, anything you've overcome in your life and all this sort of thing. So, I mean, it's a really intimidating environment and uh, <laughs> they're, they're like, you're just, a, you're just an Irish dancer. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, where do you get your military esque <laughs> discipline from? And I'm like, it's literally from, from Irish dancing. And, you know, these are intimidating guys. And uh, Aunt Middleton, who, who's the chief instructor, literally said, okay, stand up. And I was, I was like, why is he asking me to stand up? You know, I had worked for months in preparation for, for this course and, you know, ensured in the best possible physical shape and mental shape. But dancing was the least of my worries, you know, leading into this course. Like, right. I hadn't thought about Irish dancing in so long. And he goes, show me some Irish dancing. And my, my initial reaction was to, you know, maybe do something with loose arms. Uh -huh. But... In that moment, they were just talking about my military-esque discipline. Yes. So, you know, it was it was sort of a tough one, and I had to just think of my feet straight away. I was like, right, what am I going to dance? Like, I'm literally just yeah. been put on the stop on the spot. So I just started doing some random stamps and trebles and shuffles, <laughs> and it was the most mortifying experience of my life. Um, and you know, I, I just done it with my arms down my by my side, and you know, tried to be quite strong and military militaristic. Right. But, uh, you know, it just felt so, so bad. Uh, but afterwards, they were like, oh, good job. And I was like, oh, it definitely wasn't my best. But they believed I was an Irish dancer, and they told me that you're doing quite well on the course. But, you know, keep it up and don't get too far ahead of yourself or whatever. So then, of course, we go through the whole course. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really until I got home that I was like, 
that dance is going to be shared like on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as dancers, we're all our own worst critic. And, you know, yes. I'm going on this TV show as a professional dancer. And, you know, I was just like, that was absolutely awful. Like, it was so bad. I was put under pressure on the spot. I was like, that's going to come across so badly. So let's just say I was anxious for months and months. This was filmed back in September, October time. And, you know, it obviously didn't air until May there last month. Um, so I was just so anxious about how it was going to come across. But thankfully, it came across OK. It, it came across better than it felt in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the clip. And in your defense, I thought you saw Irish dancing really well with it. And, it, and <laughs> it, it, I can tell it was extemporaneous. You were making it up. But I was because I was expecting, OK, you're going to do something from Warlords or something like that. And it was like. I've never seen that in the show, but hey, you know, that's 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 good. You did good there. So uh you did you did well. Yeah. Definitely a mortifying experience. Yeah. <laughs> what about in the shows? Some of the memorable experiences. And and did you have any mentors or do you have any mentors in the show that maybe took you under their wing early on and helped you navigate? Yeah. I I've, I've been really lucky in, in Lord of the Dance to have, you know so many dancers to kind of look up to when I first went in, you know, James Keegan, mm -hmm. who is, is still involved with the show. He's the, in the dance director style type role at the minute. And, you know, he's somebody who I've always looked up to and I feel as if he's improved me as a dancer and, and made me better. Tom Cunningham is another one, you know, these are guys that just set high standards and, you know, they live by these standards and lead by example. Um, you know, they, they were both, lead dancers and also uh, dance directors and dance captains throughout the show and for me you know when I first went into Lord of the Dance it was just like this is the best of the best for a reason you know and so there was always that respect that I had for those guys not only as performers but but as uh, as people and, and, and as men and um, but not only that not only you know Tom and Tom and Jimmy um, but Michael Flatley obviously who who is the, mm -hmm. you know, the main guy, the main man, the guy right. who started it all for us, you know, and um, just an inspirational guy. And, you know, if you told me when I was a kid that I would one day work with, with Michael and, you know, perform with him on London's West End and on Broadway in New York, you know, I would have told you that you're absolutely crazy. So, you know, yeah. when I joined Lord of the Dance, Michael Flatley was retired. So, you know, there was no sign of him coming back. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't even sure I would ever meet him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was like a dream of mine just to meet him. Sure. So then in, in 2014, you know, when he decided to come back and, and, and uh, you know, do a couple of tours, I was just overjoyed to be given the opportunity, you know, to dance behind him. Right. And it was just unbelievable and a, and a dream come true. Um, but, you know, there, there's lots of other dancers that, like, you know, it's hard to mention it's hard to mention loads of names, but right. like Liam, Liam Costello was a very close friend of mine. And, you know, a Lord of the Dance veteran, somebody who was with the show. He's just recently retired. Um, his last tour was in, in Taiwan there in, in 2020. And, uh, you know, he's another guy who, when I first joined, he always helped me out with steps and choreography. And he just set really good examples of giving us all on stage every mm -hmm. single night, you know, and, and it didn't matter if, you know, he had had a couple of beers the night before, you know, he was never <laughs> slacking. He was always giving it his, his all. And, yeah. um, you know, just a, a welcoming character and a really good friend of mine throughout yeah. the years and somebody who I looked up to. Um, do you know, but there's many to mention, but uh, certainly the, the, those couple are, are ones that stand out in, in my mind. Right. What about some of the advice you've been given over the years, whether it relates to Irish dancing or just life in general? Has anyone sort of said, you know, take you in aside and maybe give you some tips or maybe a quote that you live by or anything that has helped you out? Um, it's hard to think of it's hard to think of specific advice. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things that I that I just try to live by is just being better every day, you know, like. I wake up every day and just try to think to myself, right, let's be better than yesterday. You know, no matter what it is that I'm doing, try to be better. And, you know, I, I feel like that, that constant pursuit and that constant strive to be better 
um, can only be a good thing in your life, no matter no matter what road you're going down. You know, if you're constantly pushing and, you know, if you don't rest on your laurels and, you know, you don't get complacent, that's the only way to push to be better. Um, you know, on, like in Lord of the Dance, it's attention to detail. And, uh, you know, we might rehearse like a 30 second piece of the show and, you know, we'll, re we'll rehearse it for a couple of hours because that attention to detail is what, makes that wow factor for, for the audience and for the crowd and you know lord of the dance is renowned for its like military precision lines and choreography right so we work really hard on you know ensuring that lines are crisp and you know v's in warlords are like you know a perfectly straight line moving like millimeters in and out you know to, to hit the, these lines and choreography and the the standard person in the audience their eyes aren't really drawn to that because they just see a shape and it just looks perfect mm. but you know a dancer in the audience knows that like you know when you're dancing you're not on the spot you know you're bobbing up and down slightly and that takes constant movement and constant work you know to keep those lines and formations mm -hmm. but that's the way it's supposed to look to, to, to the naked eye to the normal person it's just supposed to look effortless Right. But the thing is, it takes a lot of effort to get those those shapes and formations. Yeah. But I, I absolutely love that, you know, and I I think everyone in professional shows anyway, they obviously want the show to be the best it possibly can be because, you know, if you're performing in front of people, it's your own pride that that you're thinking about along with working as part of a team and, you know, giving the best show possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that constant strive to be better and, and kind of break boundaries and, and evolve, um, you know, is something that I feel like everyone should should live by. Okay. And I understand Michael himself congratulated you after you won the SAS challenge. What did he have to say to you? Or can you share that? That's yeah, that's that's correct. I got a phone call from Michael um the day after the, the final episode went out, which was a big surprise to me. I mean, if you'd have told me when I was a kid that Michael Flatley would, would, you know, send us congratulations by, by phone. Um, wow. you know, I would have told you that you were crazy <laughs> and, you know, so it was a real surreal moment. It was really nice of Michael to take the time and, you know, he just expressed his thanks to me for showcasing, you know, the Lord of the dance team. And he said that he was proud to have me as part of the team and, you know, that's awesome. Doing, doing great things for dancers and, you know, um, yeah, to, just to get to get a phone call from Michael for him to take the time. Obviously, he's a very busy man, and you know he's a lot going on. Um, that was just a special moment, you know, something I'm really thankful for. When you when you talk about special memories, though, my mum, who sacrificed a lot for her kids, and you know, I'm one of seven, so <laughs> okay. My mum raised raised a huge family, um, but back when we performed in Broadway. Um, my mom came over to New York and someone had told Michael that my mom was in the audience that night. So he had invited her and my sister um, in backstage after the show. And there was actually, there was, I think some of the other lead dancers had family and stuff in and Michael had other guests in too. So it was quite a busy night for him, but for him to take the time to ask to come backstage so that she could meet him and, you know, get a photo and stuff. Right. It was a real special moment. And, you know, sure. it was almost like the the sacrifice that my mom had made through the years had paid off, you know, because right. ultimately Michael was a hero for her too, you know. And right. I think for everyone, like, I mean, Irish dancing wasn't exactly cool before before River Dancing, before Lord of the Dance came, came knocking. And, you know, he's the guy that really catapulted that industry into the the world the world stage and you know if it wasn't for him thousands of dancers wouldn't have had the the platform to go and, and perform all over the world and um, you know so it, it was a real proud moment for my mom to meet him and get a photo and you know that was just such a nice moment for her as well you know to kind of come and sit in the audience and uh just enjoy and reap the rewards of the sacrifice that she's made throughout the years. And, you know, um, Lauren and I, we've both been fortunate, um, but 
you know, I always say like hard work, if you're passionate, all you need is a slice of luck and, you know, who knows where it'll take you. That's true. And, and I'll tell you, speaking of Michael, had he not been in, in river dance and done what he did to get there, I wouldn't be teaching. And all the kids I've taught wouldn't have ever learned. And the people you've worked with and all countless other teachers owe a lot to what, not just him, but you know, others as well, leads and stuff like that as well. But uh, he definitely put a style and a charisma to it that really just made you want to watch what he uh, was doing, you know, and inspiring. So, Connor, what does the future hold for you? Um, who Ten knows? Years out. Ten years out. Who knows? Um <laughs> So I definitely, I definitely have some unfinished business with uh, with the touring world. You know, I feel like I still have a lot to offer, and you know, I still feel like I've some things that I'd quite like to accomplish. So, all being well, hopefully, you know, Lord of the Dance can get back on the road soon, and we can get back performing in front of audiences. Um, but more recently, I've done a bit of work with my sister Lindsay, who is a personal trainer, and. She trained me and, and put a lot of work in my preparation for the SAS Who Dares Wins course. Um, she's also a competing Irish dancer. She also made the transition from the festival style over to commission. So she was due to do Worlds last year, but obviously cancelled and now cancelled right. again. So, uh, you know, she's, she's still working hard at, at the competing side of things. Um, but her and I, we've worked together on uh, Fit ID, which is an online training program for Irish dancers. So it's all on demand. Um, you can subscribe and join for membership, and then you get access to weekly workouts um, and a host of other workouts to improve your strength, to improve your core, and to improve your overall fitness to better prepare you for your Irish dancing. So we've worked hard on that. So hopefully... Um, that can go places um, and then other than that I'm, I'm not really sure Let, let's see I've started to do bits and pieces of promo work um, back home but for me it's all about trying to pave the way for the next generation and um, you know I do a bit of teaching back at home here too which I'm incredibly passionate about right. and you know ultimately that's that's why I went on on that SAS journey is to try and pave the way and try to be, um, you know, some kind of hope or, you know, inspiration to young guys out there who may be just struggling with the stigma right. around our discipline. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm still passionate about that. And, you know, the more that I can do to kind of inspire or, or you know, shed Irish dancers in a positive light, um, then, that's what I just want to keep doing and kind of keep pushing. Sure. It seems to me though, Connor, with a, with a family full of dancers, accomplished competitive dancers, show dancers, uh, challenge winner, you know, reality TV show winners and fitness trainers. It seems like the, there's, that's a perfect recipe for the Smith school of Irish dancing. Do you, do you, do you guys ever talk about, Hey, let's parlay all of our talents and experiences and create a dance school. Yeah, I, I could definitely think that's that's something that will that will happen further down the line. You know, I mean, I teach with a, a small a small school here in in my hometown, um. So you know, hopefully that's the the like the start of 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 this journey. Sure. You know, we we've only been going um a couple of years, and um, the woman who ran the school was retiring and wanted to pass it on to someone else. So. Lauren and I have been uh, involved along with another girl who was teaching with the school. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of young ones at the minute. So, um, you know, I'm just passionate about trying to give the experience and, um, you know, any experience that I have about trying to give it to them because, you know, ultimately I'm just a normal guy and, you know, I was able to make it to Lord of the Dance and, you know, I was fortunate to be able to, you know, complete the SAS uh, Who Dares Wins. So if I can, you know, show other people what can be done, then, you know, just try and show people that there there doesn't have to be any limitations in what you can achieve as, as a person. Right. And so, yeah, I, I definitely see us um, teaching further down the line and, you know, making the school, hopefully a big family school. That's definitely something that... Uh, that I look forward to to do. 
Well, I, I hope you guys do that because, like I say, you bring experiences that a lot of uh, students would love to have and a lot of other teachers don't have. So you'd definitely be filling in that gap there. Uh, what about the future in Hollywood? Or I guess I don't know what your your version of Hollywood is over there in the UK, but show business. Let's just say show business. Any, <laughs> any leads there? Any? You said you're doing uh, some promo work. Yeah, I go, yeah, I've been doing a wee bit of promo work and I've had a couple of, of offers here and there, but I'm not sure if it'll lead to Hollywood or not. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm still just so passionate about about the, the dancing and stuff too, so I, I can't see myself hanging up the shoes anytime soon. Right. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens and, you know, let's just ride the wave and, you know, Mm-hmm. And enjoy it whilst you can because ultimately these opportunities you got to do it you got to do them whilst you're young you know so uh that's true, that's true. And, and those opportunities as you said earlier in the interview don't always come around twice so exactly yeah. well very yeah. good well connor i appreciate the uh the opportunity to have you on and, and talk about a lot of your accomplishments in dancing also in uh in show business here with this challenge and, and you know all the information that you shared, very motivational, inspiring information about, you know, pushing yourself, going through challenges, preparing yourself for things that may be coming, staying your best, uh, all great information for people out there, male, female dancers, it doesn't matter. That universality of of trying to improve is, it doesn't matter, you know, who you are. Uh, thanks for coming on and sharing all that. And I wish you and your sisters and your whole family nothing but success. No problem, Richard. Listen, thanks for taking the time to, to talk to you this evening. It was uh, it was a fun chat, and uh, you know, thanks for giving me the platform to speak to you know, hopefully, the younger generation of dancers who are out there. Absolutely. Well, I'll I'll, I'll take the liberty of speaking on behalf of Irish dancing. We're all proud of you, man. We're all <laughs> proud of what you're doing. Uh, not just you, but you know, Lauren is certainly contributing her part to to promoting Irish dancing, and you know, it's just great and couldn't ask for better representation from you guys oh thank you very much that that means a lot and uh you know this the support that i've received you know thus far has just been so overwhelming so i'm just i'm just glad it all worked out and i was able to kind of showcase irish dancers and, and the industry right. in a positive light so thank you very much sure and before we sign off i definitely want to let people know where they can find more information about uh fit id sure yes yeah. so you can get uh you can check us out on our website, which is fitirishdance.com. So that's just in one word. And then on Instagram as well at fitirishdance. Okay, very good. Thanks again, Connor. All the best, man. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay.